Remember, the ball's got to go at least 10 yards before it can be recovered by one of their own teammates. What you are about to see is the end of the 2002 Grey Cup championship game between the Montreal Alouettes and the Edmonton Eskimos of the Canadian Football League. It's the fourth quarter, and Edmonton is attempting the onside kick to get the ball back while currently sitting about two points down. A successful conversion here, followed by whatever heroics that Edmonton quarterback Ricky Ray could pull together, will mean that Edmonton has won their first Grey Cup in nine years. The Montreal Alouettes, however, have their own plans to put a stop to that win their first Grey Cup since 1977. But before we could truly get into these final few seconds of the game, we have to get into the years that came before the Alouettes became the Alouettes of the 2000s and how a strange chapter in the history of the Canadian Football League led to not only the current Montreal Alouettes, but also just made an impact on the league for years to come. So, let's take this back to 1993. Have gone all the way this time. Congrats to the Edmonton Eskimos for winning the 1993 Grey Cup just a few hours south of their home city where they came out victorious in Calgary, Alberta, after taking it to their rivals, the Calgary Stampeders, the week before in the Western Division Final. They won that one by a score of 29-15, and then the next week they won it again in Calgary, except this time, it was the big one. For the uninitiated, the playoff format in the Canadian Football League is not too different from what you may see in the NFL, but with the smaller league size, things do kind of get a little bit different, so let's check it out. The first place Calgary Stampeders won the Western Division, so they get to stay at home and host all the playoff games. Edmonton and the Saskatchewan Rough Riders ended up in second and third place respectively, so Edmonton got to host a playoff game in the first round. The 10 and 8 BC Lions had a better record than the 3 and 15 Toronto Argonauts, which also meant that BC had clinched a playoff spot that year a couple games ahead of. Hold on, Sacramento. As, as in Sacramento, California. Yes, Sacramento, California. What? For reasons that are not entirely clear to me, in 1993, the CFL added a ninth team into the league when the Sacramento Gold Miners became the first expansion team since the BC Lions to join the league. They did not do so well their first year, landing on a 6-12 record to kick off their inaugural season. I guess in the grand scheme of things that should be expected with an expansion team in their first year, but things get a little bit weirder after that and the floodgates opened up. By 1994, the CFL had expanded and added three new teams into America with the introduction of the Shreveport Pirates, the Las Vegas Posse, and the Baltimore Stallions to compete with their friends in Sacramento. To be clear, this story doesn't have a happy ending for any of the teams involved, and if you're not sure why, then I'll spell it out for you. The Canadian Football League, primarily based in Canada, decided it would be a brilliant idea to add American teams into the Canadian Football League. And to review, these weren't teams located in places that would make sense, like, you know, border cities like Rochester or Spokane, maybe Portland, Oregon, or Portland, Maine, or Milwaukee. Any of those would have made sense, but no. The Canadian Football League chose teams in the southern region of the country, with the exception of the Baltimore Stallions. This was always doomed from the start, but if you really want an idea of how badly it was doomed to fail, here's the whole CFL USA experience summed up in one clip. Oh, Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love, in all thy sons command, with growing hearts we see thee rise, the true and strong and free from far and wide oh canada all these teams suddenly came across the border into america and there's one thing worth noting here at this point in their history it's that montreal actually doesn't have a team playing football at this moment by 1987, the Alouettes had folded and Montreal was left without a football team until the early 90s when the Montreal machine of the World League of American Football came and played for a couple seasons under American football rules before unceremoniously folding in the 1992 season right before the CFL's USA expansion was set to kick in. I don't know much about the circumstances behind the USA expansion nor why Montreal didn't have a team at this point in their history, 
But I would personally imagine it's a swift kick to the junk of Alouette's fans who have been waiting for their beloved team to return, only to find that literal cities in America were getting teams in the league before they did. By its very nature, the CFL is drastically different from the NFL, not just in that their league was primarily Canadian up until this point, but also in the actual sets of rules that the Canadian game played compared to their friends south of the border. One of the quirks of the CFL for the uninitiated is that teams have to abide by what is simply called the ratio. It means you have to have a certain number of Canadian players on the field at all times. This helps grow the game in Canada and helps bring certain Canadian talents to the forefront, as evidenced by the sudden breakout stardom of Nathan Rourke, who immediately left the BC Lions to, at the time of this writing, go play the role of quarterback three in Jacksonville in the NFL. American teams, however, did not have to abide by the ratio because of labor laws in America, which in theory meant you could just stuff your team entirely with Americans and win the championship that way, because why not, right? Well, kind of, but not really. In their one season in the CFL, the Las Vegas Posse landed on an absolutely dismal 5-13 record, which was good for dead last in the Western Division. The Gold Miners came in fourth that year with a 9-8-1 record, which was an improvement over last year's record, to be fair, but it still wasn't quite enough to get them anywhere. The Pirates, though, they boasted the worst record in the CFL that year at a 3-15 landing point. So, what exactly happened here? Look... American teams trying to play a Canadian game was never going to end well, and it seems pretty obvious why, right? At this point, I should probably elaborate further on my claim from earlier that Canadian football and American football are, in fact, two very different styles of play. For example, Canada only has three downs to work with as compared to America's four downs. The Canadian field is 110 yards, America's field is 100, and Canada famously has a no-fair-catch rule along with what is gently known as the Rouge. It's a lot to get into right now, and I'll link a video in the description explaining the rules better than I could, but my point stands here. So you take a bunch of American coaches and American players who don't have to abide by the Canadian ratio rules and probably never knew much about the Canadian game, and suddenly they're thrust into the exciting world of three-down football. The results were pretty much exactly what was expected with the expectation of... Uh, Congrats to the BC Lions for winning the 1994 Grey Cup against... Oh, hey, Baltimore, what are you doing here? Well, believe it or not, Baltimore knew that in order to succeed in the Canadian game, you had to have personnel who knew the Canadian game and some pretty good players to boot. So to that end, they hired head coach Don Matthews, who won the 1985 Grey Cup with the BC Lions and had coached for other CFL teams as well. They also touted the league's most outstanding player in running back Mike Pringle, who had come off a monstrous 1994 helping lead Baltimore to the Grey Cup and what was an unfortunate nail-biting loss from start to finish. 1995, though, was different for a few reasons, and not just because the team had to change their name to the Stallions after losing a lawsuit against the NFL over the name Baltimore CFL Colts, which they started playing the 1994 season as. But, you know... The NFL decided that they were going to sue for the name, and that forced them to change the name, eventually becoming Baltimore FC. Over the next season, though, they would become the Baltimore Stallions. The Las Vegas Posse had folded after their sole disastrous season, and behind-the-scenes shenanigans led to them almost moving to Milwaukee, and then almost moving to Jackson, Mississippi, and almost again moving to Miami after a dispersal draft, which left the team with very little to speak of at the time. Anyhow, the Las Vegas Posse, in essence, are no more, so let's pour one out for the Miami Manatees and the Las Vegas Posse real quick, okay? They all come back into play later on in the story. But the league did get an extra set of teams in 1995, with Memphis expanding into the league to become the Memphis Mad Dogs, and Birmingham, Alabama expanding into the league to become the Birmingham Barracudas. Sacramento eventually moved to San Antonio to be closer to their fellow American teams, and for the 1995 season, the CFL realigned itself into two divisions of the North and South, respectively. We've got eight teams in Canada and five teams in America, so let's see how the 1995 season shakes out. Okay, so that went about as expected down South. Baltimore stayed excellent while San Antonio picked up the momentum Sacramento was putting down, and really the only eye-catching detail was that everyone except the Pirates wound up with at least a 500 record. 
Up north, Alberta reigns supreme while the Lions, Ticats, and Blue Bombers all manage to qualify for playoff spots. The Argos, the Rough Riders, and the Rough Riders <laughs> all missed out, but hey, there's always next year. The South Division's excellence comes to a head in the division final when the Stallions and Texans meet up in what is a resounding win for the Stallions to head back to the Grey Cup for the second year in a row. Elsewhere, the Calgary Stampiers trounced Hamilton and Edmonton to get to the final, and for the second year in a row, we get an American-Canadian Grey Cup Finals matchup. All the chips are set in place for something really beautiful to happen, except they don't. On November 6th, 1995, a day after the division semifinals, an announcement has made that rocks Baltimore to its core. It seems like it became the perfect time for everything to simply fall apart. You see, in the NFL, the city of Baltimore had become something of a bargaining chip for teams, as the city had lacked an NFL team since the Colts had moved in the middle of the night in March of 1984, and, you know, because of that, owners were threatening to move all of their teams to Baltimore if they didn't get what they wanted in their current city in the way of a new stadium or more money or something of that ilk. On November 6, 1995, Cleveland Browns owner Art Modell makes good on his threats and announces that he's moving the Browns to Baltimore, where they do eventually become the Ravens. If you really want to know how I feel about it, take a good look. What this meant more than anything was that suddenly the Stallions didn't look like such a good thing for the city of Baltimore anymore, even as they were on the brink of heading back to the big game for the second year in a row. As the story goes, support dried up overnight, and the Stallions had to give away cheap and free tickets to get 30,000 people to the game. The previous year, they didn't have to worry about that, they had drawn an extra 5,000 people, but now the NFL is coming to town. In essence, and pardon my French, who gives a shit anymore, right? Believe it or not, a lot of folks do actually, just probably not in the way you'd expect. And I'm cheering for Calgary, and they're the Canadian team, so I want the North to win. If, if it was warm, it wouldn't be Canadian football, I think. This makes it totally Canadian. It's great. And the CFL is teetering between the American teams dominating the league or deserting the league. Does it mean that the Stevens Cup goes out to you? I think it sucks. I mean, it won't ruin my life or anything. But... Oh, if they're going to participate in the league, they should be entitled to all the benefits. For the second year in a row, the Great Cup was no longer just a battle of East and West as it had been for so many years beforehand. It was now a battle of Canada versus America. Everyone in Canada, except Edmonton fans, were pulling for Calgary to beat the Stallions and for Canada to reign supreme, and to remind those dirty Yanks that this is Canada's league and Canada's game. Two weeks after that announcement comes and the sport starts drying up bit by bit, Baltimore goes to Regina and Saskatchewan and beats the Calgary Stampeders by a score of 37-20. to It would become the first, and as of this writing, the only time an American team would win the Grey Cup. A fun little statistic I like to remind my Canadian friends of is that an American team has won the Grey Cup more recently than a Canadian team has won the Stanley Cup. Sit on that and ponder for a while, why don't you? The day after winning the South Division Final, Baltimore's owners met with the CFL Commissioner and said, in short, we're going to pay our bills, but we're done. That game would eventually become the last CFL game to happen on American soil. The team folded at the end of the season and eventually became the latest and current incarnation of the Montreal Alouettes. To this end, it doesn't particularly surprise me that the Stallions eventually moved. They were an American team in a Canadian league that had to compete with American college football in the fall when the season was winding down, and now the NFL had announced they were coming back to Baltimore, which would have given the Stallions another thing to compete with. And to that end, trying to get Americans to care about a team in a primarily Canadian league playing a style of football that was unfamiliar to them while also competing with however many separate teams and leagues, it would have just been a disaster waiting to happen had the team stayed put. It would have turned the Stallions into nothing more than a minor league team at best in a city that would eventually go on to become the only city to win a Grey Cup and a Super Bowl. They would have basically become a shell of the team that they would eventually be remembered as, and as it's been said, it's better than burn out than fade away. Fuck you, Art Odell. Believe it or not, as a side note, San Antonio at this time actually still had plans to keep it all going, and the Stallions at one point planned to keep things running in America as well, albeit in Houston, where that city was set to lose the Oilers until a league official stepped in and told them in so many words, it's over. On February 2nd, 1996, all the American CFL teams had formally folded. One of the lingering questions that has stayed in my head for the longest time about this whole debacle was simply, why? 
it seemed like a bad idea on paper and there was no way that this was ever going to work out the way that anybody hoped it would work out in the first place, but at the same time, it doesn't seem surprising when I remembered that the CFL has always been a league on the brink of folding for one reason or another, including financial instability. If anything, I guess expansion fees probably allowed the league to survive for as long as it has. The legacy of CFL USA was mostly one of it being a joke, but the Stallions remained the model team that showed it could have worked when given the right circumstances. To that end, if you're a fan of the CFL in the current day and age, and especially if you're a fan of the Montreal Alouettes, say thank you to your friends in America. They probably helped save your league. When the Stallions eventually moved to Montreal, they were allowed to have a special expansion draft that would allow the club to draft all the Canadians they would need to meet the ratio requirements for the shift back up north. They also got lucky and were able to retain most of the Stallions roster and, with the glaring exception of head coach Don Matthews, they managed to keep most of their coaching staff that helped keep the team as competitive as they were in those two seasons as a club. Players who stayed on board included star quarterback Tracy Hand and running back Mike Pringle. Don Matthews would eventually go on to coach the Toronto Argonauts two Grey Cup victories in a row. And if you really want to know how I feel about that, well, take a good look. Got it? Okay. The story of America's legacy doesn't just start and end with a really bad O Canada and the Baltimore Stallions, though. Anthony Calvillo, the starting quarterback for the Las Vegas Posse in their own season, he eventually make his way to Montreal as a free agent in 1998, where he would go on to become not only Montreal's franchise quarterback, but simply one of the greatest to ever play the Canadian game. In fact, here he is in 2002 throwing missiles for the Alouettes at the Grey Cup game. Oh, and another thing about the 2002 Alouettes team and the Baltimore Stallions. They did bring back Don Matthews to lead the team back to the promised land that year, as he did with those same players in 1995. The loss of the Baltimore Stallions is ultimately remembered as nothing more than a semi-significant footnote in the ever-continuing history of the Canadian Football League. The 1995 Stallions are often considered one of the greatest CFL teams of all time, but none of that matters. The Ravens are Baltimore's team now. Having put a couple of Super Bowl championships on their belt, and in the end, Montreal got to live on as a new version of themselves. Ironically, it was the Stallions' success that also ended up being the big piece that would lead to their downfall. I have friends with relatives that lived in Canada around the time that expansion happened, and my understanding of the whole ordeal, according to them, was that it turned them off from the league because they stopped trying to be radically Canadian, and, you know, they tried too hard to court an American audience that was never going to care about the league. In 2015, 20 years after the championship victory, many of the Stallions reunited and got to properly celebrate their breakup victory, and as owner Jim Sparrow said, no one is ever going to forget this team, and he simply called it the greatest thing he had ever done with his life. General Manager Jim Pop just simply said they were the greatest team ever assembled in the CFL. Every now and then, as an April Fool's joke, someone will make a crack about an American team coming to the league or that an exhibition game is finally going to happen in America again. We make jokes every now and then and speculate about what could have been and what possibly could be in the future, but when asked about in all seriousness, the CFL in recent years has simply just stated, expansion into the USA was a mistake. All these things are probably true, but if it wasn't for those decisions that the CFL, the NFL, Art Modell, and the city of Baltimore all made as a collective whole, we probably wouldn't have managed to get where we are in 2002 with the Alouettes on the verge of something very important for the first time since 1977. Long live the Baltimore Stallions, but you know what? I've kept you waiting long enough. Let's let the clip play out. This is RVVD reminding you to kick out the Rouge, motherfuckers. Peace.